obviously happy holidays to everybody out there watching the Spitfire be built. We need a little break. It's time to put a day in on this uh, Christmas village, let's call it. My wife had a tremendous collection of stuff. We framed this out a while back. Got everything to this point. Now what we're trying to do is time to decorate the tree, get the tree out, get all the little buildings out, and kind of make this guy come alive. What I'm trying to do is dry fit the tree here to make sure we have clearance on everything here. Now the object of this is I want to see what areas here I can make for uh, some roads and how to start arranging the buildings. You know, I have, after a dry fit, I have a, uh, a very accurate spot of where the tree stand is going to be. What I want to do is lay out the buildings and start drilling some holes for the, uh, the wires to go through. All of these buildings have lights in them. Now this is just a rough layout. We put everything out here just to see, well, how much room we have, how many more thousand buildings we're going to buy this year. And I really do enjoy collecting this stuff. I have to tell you, I'm like a uh, really, <laughs> really into this. Really like it. Anyway, I know the tree will fit. And the next thing is to get Karen when she comes home. She's at work, come home and uh, rearrange the buildings the way she wants them. And of course there will be, there will definitely be an airport as part of it. This is from Bob English. Bob English is, sent, is a... Uh, you're getting it all over the floor! Well, get me something to put this oh in. Oh my God. I can't open it. Let her get on the floor Size so she can open it. No, no, well, no, no. you clean it up then. No, 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 no. I need to, I need to put this in something. All right, hang on. And right. she takes the doll out of the box. She places it on the table. Now, he didn't know. I never mentioned to him that you like cherubs and angels and stuff. She yeah. opens the poppy material. Look at all this stuff. I have a lifetime supply of packing peanuts. She places the lotion. Be careful. Be careful. This, <laughs> this is a handmade porcelain doll. I am being careful with you. This is from Bob English. Now, anybody who hasn't seen the Nats videos, I helped Bob English do a little work on his plane, and of course, uh, his his wife makes these dolls. Well, it looks oh beautiful. Even the Oh my God! It looks beautiful. Oh, wait till you see this. Oh my goodness! Anybody out there in the world that's not would like to donate a doll to this lovely woman? <laughs> oh my God! Look at this. Stace, can you give me a hand? Yeah. She yeah. Be careful. Be careful. Hold on. Okay. It's a Spitfire doll. You, help you hold on to her. Tell me we don't have any friends in the hold world of stunt oh, here. Oh my beautiful. God! Look at this. Oh, is this gorgeous? Oh my look God! She's gorgeous. Just nuts roasting you know, on an open colors. fire. Oh, she's got colors on it. Oh, she has. Mrs. Kane. It's a whole house. Which wife makes these? Jack Frost nipping at your nose. People pay for these. Look at that. People pay for 
pay for these videos Bob. while you sing it. Yes. Bob. Bob. How the hell is anybody talking Bob, to you? She's, she's gorgeous. She's elegant. Bob, a whole house is full of angels and cherubs and all and these handmade things. Elegant. Look, as we speak, as we speak, look at this. Look at this. Truth in advertising. One cherub, two cherubs. Notice they're all nude, too. Unbelievable. Because they're pure. Shush. Where are we going to put it? Beautiful. Bring it in with our collection. Shush. Go. Go. Show the sacrament. Look at this. In the middle of making a village, we have to find a spot for our... Bob, look, as we speak, Bob, you think we don't have any angels in this house? Look at this. Notice they're all a little chubby, too. No angels in this house, huh? Look at this lamp. Look at even the lamps. Oh, my God. Here's one, too. He's a little angel. There's another one. Look, another little one. See, my wife thinks I'm an angel. Not quite. <laughs> Not quite. Okay. Look at this. The old dolls. dolls. Dolls everywhere. Dolls. Dolls on... These guys are, you know, the guys, I'm trying to tell these guys on video that what a macho guy I am and all the, look, dolls on dolls bicycles, dolls, angels, oh my God, villages, they are going to think that I, yeah, unbelievable. Come on, find a spot, baby. Just nuts rusting on an open fire. There it is, right near our, right underneath our happy wedding picture. Oh, Bob, thank you very much. I'll send you a copy of this tape so you can see what fun this was. The next thing I have to do on my village, my village, I have to drill a hole for every house to run the wire for the lighting. So I'll start on that today and see how far I get. Now the idea here is to trace out all the buildings and where the holes go for the lights. And then I'll get ready to paint the streets and drill the holes and paint, put the streets in all in one shot. said let there be light okay I'm ready to start painting the roads now I had to pull up some of the track here so that I could conveniently get in and paint this station area Now, I painted this with slow dry and enamel. And this is diamond dust. Try to make this look a little bit like maybe it snowed here. This is nice stuff. I used to put this in the paint jobs on the Harleys until it went out of style. It's like metal flake. I'll show this up close. Hey, you may want to use this on one of your planes even. Just sprinkle some of it in there. Good material to use on your plane. Diamond flake. <laughs> $80 for a little can like this. Now I'm just laying out the sidewalks with a, with a crayon here. And I want to make the sidewalks a different color than the, uh, the pavement so obviously it, it all doesn't look uh, monochromatic.
Now, a good material for putting the fencing down is uh, just old plain window caulking. Okay, we got one little section. <laughs> this is starting to shape up. One little section done already. the kitchen door. Got a nice biplane out on the runway getting ready to take off here. <laughs> and a nice model plane. Somebody left a nice model plane right out in front of the hangar. Wonder who that could be. So we'll be ready to start on a lower level in the next session. I laid out my little skating pond and laid out all my other buildings here in the front row. Now we're going to take a break from this and work on a Spitfire for the next couple of days. We're waiting to get some more accessories, some more people, some more all little, little doodads. Karen's going to go out shopping, so I'll get some work done on the Spit. Now, I, <laughs> hey, I hope you've been in. Oops, some of this stuff. I hope you've been enjoying uh, as we're working on his village. We're doing it. Uh, during family time so it works out real well. Anyway, one of the things to think about at this point in time and I've been giving it some thought is I have the, the other few sites to cut out. I'm not going to get a whole lot done today but I wanted to go through my wood inventory and luckily, luckily, as I always do, I go through my wood inventory, find my nice sheets of plywood, 16th plywood, 24 inches long. I just wanted to pass some, a couple of quick stories on and these are significant stories. One of the things, I remember Gene Schaefer, one of my uh, candidates for best flyer of all time, and certainly everybody has their own favorite, one of my favorites was Gene. Gene would do all kinds of crazy things to, to make the plane lighter. He would make cake string holding the landing gear wires on, and the screws and do every possible thing, but he never, never substituted the 16th plywood doublers. Now, without trying to embarrass anybody, I will not mention a name, but we have a, a flyer at Flushing that every year comes out with a plane, and from time to time the motor just won't run. And we always spend a good part of our time trying to figure out why his motor doesn't run. Well, one of the things after a plane was crashed we found out was, and this is a significant thing, because I know a lot of people fall into this trap, is he only wound up buying 12-inch plywood. Well, what happened is the plywood ended almost at the wing. I mean, it, this is at 11 inches to here. It ended here. And what would happen is he'd spend basically the whole 
better part of the summer trying to get a motor run, trying to figure out why wheels were coming off and vibration and screws and everything. Complete unbelievable pain in the ass for everybody at the field because he didn't want to go out and buy 24 inch plywood. Oh, it's just for a laugh. See, a sheet of this plywood is nine dollars, eight thirty-five. So with the shipping, it's probably nine bucks. That'll make an airplane. Well, it means nine dollars is in these plywood doublers. And I guess you could make a case to save three dollars and use some other material. And I know people, and I don't want to make a politically incorrect thing here. I know people have tried to eliminate or been successful at eliminating the doublers. Paul Walker is not one of them. Uh, but other people have tried to use various things from Jimmy Casal used to use 64th plywood and about two-thirds of his planes the motor would shake and should I call it the shake and bake needle valve setting and and various other tricks tricks to make a plane light and since we're doing things to try to make the plane light one of the things we're not gonna fool with if you fool with other things don't fool with the plywood doublers now I also I have done this, and this is really unproductive. I've taken sheets of this plywood and weighed the plywood to try to make lighter plywood. Well, the difference in the plywood was not a significant enough thing to even worry about. I also remember Dave Cook showing me something that the, one of the stunt form tapes where he had the plywood all hogged out so it was like windows, like picture windows and stuff. I'll have to look for that piece on the tape. That was interesting. Believe it or not, Dave Cook's plane did have a motor run, but, but I hate to think that maybe you could spend this whole winter or this whole amount, of, especially the amount of time it takes to do a Spitfire, all this detail, and then you get to the field, and the plane needs nose weight anyway, and you go to flip the prop, and, the, and you go to get the needle valve, and it's... So, the lesson of the day, even though we're not going to do, well, we, ain't, we aren't going to do anything today, I'm just going to go through my wood is make sure, in my case, I'm making two planes, I have two pieces of 16 plywood. And some of the other substitutes, and maybe they are, maybe that carbon mat, I've heard people making planes with carbon mat and all kinds of stuff. Well, you know, that's a maybe to me. My feeling is 16 plywood is a must. Right now, get the sheets of plywood out and don't fool around. And that's, that's such a significant... Now, I've got a little bit of time tonight. And this is one of the things I seem to be able to do real well, is take advantage of little gaps of time. I have the two other pieces that I want to make up into fuse sides. First thing I want to do is I want to make sure I have a straight edge on these pieces. And if I don't, I'll true up an edge. Now these are not straight. If they're not straight, we definitely want to true one edge up first. Let me show this. Let's see how much off this is. Now you can see how much this piece is off. So, first thing I want to do, put a straight edge on one side. And tra I want to wind up with four fuse sides that are all mirror images. So it's the original one I want to use, the one that still has the incline left on. And I want to lay this out. So I start with a perfectly straight edge before I even trace out the rest of this. And what's nice is these two pieces are the better, the better grain. They're both more sea grain than the original. So I'm hoping these aren't going to spring as much. Again, using that great Midgley 48 inch ruler. One of the things I try to take advantage of is anytime I get a few extra minutes like I have right now, I try to get some little mundane work like this done on it. Now let's see if we have a nice true edge. Now you can see we have almost no variance at all. Now I can use the same pinholes over and over again to line this part up while I trace it out.
Now it's so nice to have the pins be able to trace this. And of course I do want to use the straight edge to do all my cutting. Now I wound up the other day getting both of the fuse sides cut and I want to make sure at the end of this little session, and this will be a very short session, anytime I can get a couple little odds and ends of things done like this, it's just less I have to do in the next session. I can go right down this. One, two, three. And I hope I roll. Anytime I can get a little bit ahead, it's just one, one step further I'm ahead for the next session. And this time of year, things are so hectic and so chaotic. You never know when uh, you're going to get hit with some kind of shopping trip or whatever. Just dress everything off here with a sanding block. Now remember, on, on all replica parts, we want to cut red line right off or, or and or go right through it. Now here's an unusual situation. I have a really nice piece of sea grain wood that's the right length. If you look down at it, it's got a hook right in the end. Right at the very end it goes, so what I'm going to try to do, I'm looking down the grain and I'm seeing, well, I can trim off the, the back end, that's no problem. But right here I'd really like to, like to get the down, maybe uh, I'm going to try to space the fuselage side out. So I cut off that top part. I want to get it down as far into this piece of wood as possible, always trimming off the top of the curve if I can. Now I'm going to, rather than trying to lay this out on the top, or in the center, as I said, I'm going to try to cut far down, but I need to know how far down I can go here and be reasonable about it. Let me just make a light tracing on here of where I think is the lowest I could possibly go. And take the, the ruler. Again, you never know if this is going to work. A lot of times you do this and you just you waste a piece of wood because it just pops worse than before. But let's see if we can save if we can salvage it this way. We've gotten rid of let's hope the last 6 inches of where this was bowed. Now you can see by looking at the ruler's edge here it looks like this didn't pop much at all. In fact, it looks real good. So now it looks like what we've done is we've managed to salvage a piece of wood that had a real hook in the end of it. And these are, the, we really only had four really good pieces, so I'm really trying to salvage this. Now when I pin this piece to it, see I only have just a little bit to trim. I wouldn't want to go all the way to the edge just in case this springs the other way. But now what I'll do, I'll lay this out with the red pen just trim that last little bit and hope that it doesn't spring. And I'll do that before I cut the hole for the wing. The reason being, I would like to know if it's going to spring. If it springs, I'll use this for some other thing. If it doesn't spring, if it stays relatively straight, I'll cut the wing, the hole for the wing, and then I'll have what amounts to be another fuse side. So I just put a rough, a rough red line on here so I know pretty much where I want to carry that edge. Again, not every piece of wood you get, and especially not every piece of sea grain, four pound wood winds up being, uh, I'll just trace this out lightly too, winds up being usable, but if you can salvage a piece, I always, especially this, at this weight, so hard to get the wood this weight. And it looks like it's pretty good. It looks like it didn't spring at all. Definitely usable.
And every time I can get a little mini session like this in, every time I can get even a half an hour down here, I get one step further toward having the RAF flying here. And it feels like this piece is a little more grainy than the others. I'm getting some hard spots as I try to cut through. Take some more cuts to get this. There we go. Boy, there's some hard spots in this piece. Unbelievable. Okay, even in this mini session, we got a lot accomplished. I got all four of the full sides sitting down here. So even in a small amount of time, you can get little stuff like this done. And you'll one step ahead later on. Boy, I love being ahead. <clears throat> now, I think the last thing I'm going to get to do tonight is I want to drop all four of these down together. Make sure I'm on a straight edge. Make sure I have all the wing cutouts the same. And while it's laying on a straight edge, I want to run a couple of pins right through them. Remember, what I'm looking for here is mirror imaging. I want to have, since Joe and I hopefully will have planes that weigh the same, I don't want to have one fuselage be two ounces heavier, or one more rigid, or in that case, one more flimsy, or longer, or shorter, or anything. Looking for as much symmetry as we can get. So by pinning these all together, what I'm going to hope to achieve is to get them all relatively the same. Now I'm sighting down. See, so you have a real nice edge on. It's going to be the reference edge. All four of them pinned together. And I'll true up all the other edges around here is the next step. Now with the pins holding them together, this is a pretty good, pretty reasonable way of getting mirror imaging. even want to have the, the cowl lines exactly the same so that the cowlings, if we do get to mold them like we're hoping we can do, they won't be different. They'll almost hopefully be interchangeable. Now to get an idea just how symmetrical these parts are, let me pull out some of the pins and it almost looks like it's cut from one piece of wood. It's pretty symmetrical. <laughs> now next thing I want to do is get some accurate, accurate weights on the fuse sides. Now they all should be symmetrical, they all have pretty much the same cutouts. This one is 18, and I can just record each one. Now the weights we got on the sides were 14, 14, 18, and 19. So what I'll try to do is keep in mind that these the two heavier sides, I'll try to get a little extra sanding in them when we get to the sanding operation. I want to keep this as symmetrical as possible. That's the whole thing I'm striving for here. to do is everything from the wing root back I want to be maybe three thirty second of an inch and everything from the the flap hinge line forward can be full eighth inch but I want to thin out the back part of this wood and I want to thin it out 
as even as I can. I use the electric uh, the vibrator sander and of course a block to finish it off. So that in effect I have a fuse side that's 3 32nd of an inch behind the wing and an eighth of an inch from the hinge line forward. Now this is the side that, <clears throat> that used to be 19 grains. I've got it down to 16 grains by thinning out from the uh, from the flap hinge line back and yet we still have the full eighth inch up in the front. So I'll do the other ones off camera and uh, the idea is now I have 14 and 16 instead of 19 and 14. I'm not starting to build one fuselage up a lot heavier than the other. You can just dress it off and finish it off with the big sanding block and then I'll get a micrometer to make sure I'm not making one a whole lot thicker than the other. Takes a little time but we're getting about four grains, three to four grains off each side. That's a total of eight grains and about 1.8 of less nose weight we should need. Should be worth about uh, half to three quarters of an ounce in the total program just by spending this extra little time. Even if it's only worth a half ounce, it's worth it. I want to see with a micrometer just roughly. Ooh, nice. I'm at a hundred. And up in the front of the fuse, I'm at 128. 128. So I probably could take just a little more off the back of these. Let's make sure I'm not making a cockamamie thing here. Okay, it looks pretty even. It looks like the sanding block's doing a pretty good job. Now I'm finding out that to get the, the piece exactly even, I really do need some extra time with the sanding block so that I maintain an, a, an equal thickness all through the back. I don't have a, you know, any points where it's thicker or thinner. Again, a micrometer is the way to do this. I would expect everybody that's at this level of building is going to be using a micrometer for something. And this might be a good idea to do on something, even if you're building a, a typical nobler or a typical anything. You can always thin out the back of the fuselage sides, that's for sure. Now you're probably thinking, well, why can't you just do it after you put the formers in? Well, yeah, it is, but it's harder to get an even thickness. This way, while I'm working on a glass, I have good pressure behind it. I get a nice even thickness. I don't get any soft or low spots. Boy, it doesn't, you can't believe how quick that wood comes off. Look at the pile of stuff that comes off of there. I'm getting about three to four grams off each side this way. That's about what we're getting off each side, three to four grams. And the last thing I want to do is just give a rough check to all of these pieces and see that they're within, uh, I would say within five thousandths, which is the thickness of an IBM card. That would be pretty reasonable. 
it had rolled real close. Anyway, it may seem like this is a lot of work for just getting off uh, a, a small amount of weight. It's not. Because remember what happens, and this is really what happens. Every square eight you'll ever do from now for all eternity, you're going to be carrying that weight around with you. So think of that old square eight, carrying around all that luggage. And because we have so many, remember the, the reason we're spending so much time on this, <clears throat> boy, the dust really gets in here. The reason we're spending so much time to get basic parts lighter than we normally would is because we know we're going to put details in, we know we're going to have cockpits and exhaust manifolds and who knows what else if, if Joe ever gets the radiators finalized, scoops, whatever. So we'd like to start with basic components, but that doesn't mean you can't use this same technology to make a Cobra or to make a tradition or to make a Cardinal. All of these ideas are ideas I think they're practical, you can, anybody can do them, and I think you can master the technique and put it right to use on your next plane. I'm going up. The wife is calling. It's been a fun day. See you tomorrow. things here. I have a doctor appointment in about an hour, so I don't know how that's going to turn out. But I figured as long as I, and this is just a good idea you can use anytime, as long as I have a half an hour, 45 minutes here, I figured I'd try to cut out the doublers, get that out of the way. And that's another secret to trying to get the most out of uh, the time you have available. Every time you can sneak in a, a half hour of building, sneak it in. Anyway, I'm going to cut out the four doublers Without, you know, without saying, make them, uh, try to get them as accurate as possible. Let's see if I can get all four of these cut out. She's almost time to go now. Well, I'll get them out as much as I can. Now even though I've used a brand new fine tooth blade, I always get a couple little odds and ends. I always need to dress the edges off and of course when I'm done with all four of them, I'll put them together and make a mirror image out of all four of them. Now one of the things I always do before I go making up the last two here, and I don't even know if I'll have time, make sure I'm not making the parts grow. What happens if you take an original part, and what I did, I used a fuse side to trace one. You don't want to then trace it onto the second one, use the second one to trace the third one, the third one onto the fourth one, or each part gets the thickness of an incline bigger. I always want to use the first part, or the original part, to trace all the, the doublers out on. Otherwise, I'm going to have an awful lot of sanding and dressing off to do. Now, these look real accurate, so I'm just going to go ahead and make up the other two. It never pays to, uh, never pays, never hurts to check this stuff though. Because I've made four parts and each one has gotten a little bigger and then when I go to put it on the original fuse side, ah, oh, I got a, an hour of sanding.
dust system. You're done with the saw, put it away. The dust is gone. Now, the only thing left to do is marry them all up later. This is the end of this session. we got to go. Marry them all up later, make mirror images out of them, and then we'll be ready to glue them to the fuse side. See you in a while. Now I'm finally back. Oh, my God. What an awful trip here. Okay. I want to get all four of the doublers lined up. I possibly can and get them all trued up. A good sanding block with a table glass is just perfect for this. Especially, especially the edge that we're going to use. Most important is that edge that we're going to use as the thrust line, center line, everything parallel line, top of the fuselage. One of the old tricks I was using many times before, and being I have to make four of these, just put some small brads in here, and this holds them together while I'm sanding that angle. I want to get all these angles sanded, and as I'm getting ready to do this, look who's back. Look who's back. Oh, my God. <laughs> the king the king of motor mounts over here. Anyway, Mike's supposed to come over later, bro. Close, but Very close. this is a nobler wing. It's close. Very close. Okay. And what do you want to do tonight? You want to just put a bell crank in there? Put a bell crank in there and make some wingtips. And you got to make wingtips. Okay. Block All right. Take it out of the cradle. It's not going to jump out by itself. That's for sure. Hey, that's monster trucks. What you gonna say okay. Mix it up till it's just like. Uh, Completely looking yeah. creamy and pearl like. Get the edges, Brian. Right. All right. Now you got to pull the wing apart a little bit, Ron. You right. take the wing completely apart. And we'll smear those two in. We'll smear the two inside edges. All right. That looks okay. Pull the wing completely apart. Bell crank out and all. I mean, the wires. Yeah. Just pull it right apart. Don't fool around. Okay. You got the other side all hacked out. Now. Smear it on both sides. All right, can you just roll it one way. Go ahead. Put a piece of tape down if you can't hold it with your hand. Roll it. Only you only can roll it either clockwise or counterclockwise. Otherwise, the the cotton comes off. Just put that down there, right? So he learns how to work by himself. Get a nice smooth coat on there. Go right down the whole edge. You really don't care about the foam. What you care about is that the wood, the wood. Because the wood is what's going to get it. Do I put some in here? No, no nothing, nothing in there. Nothing in there. That side's done. Okay, do the other side now. Tell Wait, me. Don't, don't lay it on the glasses. See, let this overhang your table. Let it overhang and do the other half. Floor. That's the hard part. Brian, the thing is if you turn the Q-tip only one way, just one way. Just keep turning it. The one cotton way. keeps getting tighter. If you go the other way, it unwinds and it becomes a ball of junk. And you want to get the epoxy right on, right on the wood, even more than on the uh, foam. That's it. Wipe the extra off. And we'll get this wing lined up and sitting in the cradles here before we even order pizza tonight. I tell you, you guys are master mechanics at this. Oh, I just got them. All, right. All right, you got time. This this takes 15 minutes to set up, so take your time. Just get it right. We'll get that little bit off the top. It's pretty good. Sight down it. Let's see. Hold it up, Brian. We might. Hold it up. Which way is it canted? Come a little more this way. We'll okay, then the side that it's bowed on, put some more tape on it on that side. Where? Which side? Put the tape on like it's a rubber band. This side? Nah, push it off the table so you're not... Where's the tape? Tape's right over there, Brian. This? This one? The side that you need more tension on. you got to use the Maybe tape like it's a rubber band. Put a piece here, Wendy. This isn't Wendy. the right tape, Wendy. It's too thin. Oh, yeah. Now, pr make sure one side is down. Hold it. Hold your fan hand on the side that's down. And then stretch it like a rubber band and then press it down. That'll give you some tension. And get it down. Got more tension, believe me. Okay, and it, you can keep putting 100 pieces on if you have to. Put them longer and longer, bigger and bigger. 
right, let's see what that did now. See if that helped. Now let us sight down it. Let's see how it looks. We're coming real close now. We need okay, to so let me sight it, Brian. Let me see. Still a little off. Okay, Still put more on the top. You can put a hundred pieces on it. Doesn't matter. Just get it. Keep putting pieces on until it's you got it nice and straight. All American plants from John Miss. This is the small All American. What for fifteen? Oh, actually, I have a twenty-five in it. They show. Uh, I think a twenty-nine in. It. Well, actually, they do show a 19 in it. 19 version. I guess 19 or 29. And you're going to go dominate the VSC with this? Well, this is a suitcase, By, this is a suitcase airplane. Brian, have you been babysitting that wing to make sure it doesn't... Uh... Now, Mike Rogers agrees he's totally responsible if this wing is crooked. He says, no problem. Where's hey. your stuff, Mike? Mike brought his grain scale over. We weighed them together. They're pretty accurate within a grain. You got some silver dry in here. Yeah. What? All right, so let's go. What's the deal with this? You gonna put this in a suitcase and ship it to uh, yeah, it's, you made it Mike Cavell or something? The landing gear is removable. The engine, obviously. The tank is removable. It slides in and yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. And I'm gonna figure out a way to have a removable rudder so that I can cram it pretty tight in a flat. Why don't you just shove it in a shopping bag? <laughs> <laughs> Sit on it. <laughs> It's pretty small. Let me fly it one time. Yeah, we'll make it. Give it to, give it to John DeTavio. He'll make it real small in one fly. <laughs> yeah, I won't be lending this thing. No, 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 no. no. Three flights on this one. Yeah, there's like a big bug in there. But I liked, uh, I liked Lou Walker's Internet's winner, and that was a pretty small plane. Yeah. And, uh, Doug Benedetti warned me. Well, how big is Hunt's little plane? About That's the same about size? The same size. Yeah, Hunt's that flew good. I saw the plans of Hunt's plane, and he left off optional fixed flaps, and he says that, that he might have benefited by putting them on, a little more wing area. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's got some but uh, this is a, a bit smaller, and it's got, I think, I don't know, it may have shorter moments, but at any rate, we put a four-inch bell crank in it, so oh, we're, not gonna, we're not going to have problems. Why not put this. power steering in it? <laughs> Listen, when are we going to see the ballerina? Cut this shit short. When's the I'll, ballerina I'll coming over here? Next Monday. We're gonna, next, is that a promise? Next yeah, Monday I ballerina? Promise, yeah, it'll, be, it'll be fairly complete by then. Maybe I'll put the ribs in. Maybe we'll put the ribs in next Monday night. I just want to get a nice smooth finish on both sides so that I don't wind up with a bunch of epoxy that I don't need on here. The smoother I can get that, the less epoxy I'll need to glue these on. And I just want to dress this off with some real fine paper. Again, the smoother you can make this, the less grooves there'll be, the less epoxy you'll need to do the, the final lamination. We had a really good session tonight. I'm trying to get these. The object here is to get the fuse double as dry in tonight so tomorrow I can work on the crutches. Notice what I've done is lay out. I've sanded these real well. And I mark each side so I make matching sides. Now just remember. Matching sides. Everybody that's ever built planes has always done and made two left sides or two right sides, including me. So I'm trying to lay these out, make sure I have two left and two right. Of course, the same thing with the doublers. I'm going to mix up the epoxy. We should have plenty of epoxy left over from doing Brian's job. Now I can push these away. Now what I like to do is lay the part down. Squeeze the parts together, make sure you have plenty of epoxy on both sides. And what I want to do, I'm going to do one side at a time. Make sure I get a good bond on here. Just like glass, it's so very similar to glass in a wing. 
And what I want to do, I want to hit. I want to hit this with a little bit of heat. And scrape off all the extra. Now, obviously, you don't want to take it all off. You just want to take enough off that you don't have a, a two-pound fuselage side. Now this really gets the epoxy nice and thin. You can card off all the extra, of course. Again, have the jar of alcohol handy. Make sure we get a good bond here. I want to get my jar of alcohol out before we go any further. Now you want to make sure at this point in time you position the top, I'll show this on a close up, the top edge. It'll save a lot of sanding and mess later on. Now I'm going to do one at a time and put it aside to dry with some weights on it. Now I got my heavy duty sanding block holding that down so it squeezes it nice and flush and three gallons of uh, I guess that's enough weight to hold that piece and now I'll just go right down the list and do the other three off camera now I let these sit about 15 minutes the glue is just about getting ready to kick off I pull them all apart again wipe all the glue off the edge this will just save me some sanding in the next session. Make sure I'm not gluing two or three of these together as the glue oozes out. Once you set it under those weights, the glue starts oozing out. Of course, all this is going to do is save us some work tomorrow or the next session. I like to get all the front. See, this one, this one the glue really oozed out. I had it. Probably a little more than I wanted glue in there. Don't want to shortchange that though. That nose section is going to be doing a lot of work. And then what I'll do is put these aside to dry tonight. Let them dry for a whole night under pressure. I'll try to line them up this way. Can just hear Big Jim right now. Don't be cheap with the glue. Put the glue on. Alright, green away. Plenty of glue. Plenty of epoxy. I'll lay this down right here. Put our block right on top. Get some gallon cans on here. Let's get some full ones. Put this aside to dry and come back on the next session. It should be all set to do the final sanding on. It. 
Now, today I separated these, and as always happens, you can guarantee it. One little drop of epoxy worked its way down, and they got all stuffed together. I had to pull them apart like, ah, aggravating. Anyway, what I like to do is I like to dress off all the plywood because there's always some little, little drops of epoxy or whatever to sit on here. And then I want to taper where the, where the doubler ends to the fuse side so we don't have a stress riser there. So I'll just lightly sand these off, get all the edges trued up, and there's always just a little bit of epoxy that hangs out on here. Always just enough to make you crazy. And then I'll true those doublers up with a Dremel tool. Again, what I'm trying for is ultimately to have all four of these that they're complete mirror images of each other. I want to dress off all the edges again with a fine block and I want to dress off where the doubler ends you don't want it to end at a 16th plywood and then just go into a fuse side you want a nice smooth transition that kills the stress riser it'll tend not to give you a crack in the paint right where the doubler ends Trying to maintain that nice square edge on everything. Now what I'm doing here, and this this is one step I never leave out, is I want to seal the edge where the plywood and the balsa join just run a, a bead of thin CA down. What this does, it hardens up the edge of the wood. For all the joining and lining up that we're going to have to do, it gives us a hard edge to work off. Also, the same thing on the bottom. Just run a bead there, wipe it with a paper towel. It also seals up any little corners, and these did seal pretty good with the epoxy, but it just seals it up just a little bit better. I'm also going to do inside the wing. That's, it may seem like, wow, this is taking a long time to make a set of body sides. Well, you know, if you want that very rigid body, and also have it under whatever weight, the projected weight you know you have. It just takes a little more effort than just slapping on some eighth inch fuse sides and some doublers and epoxying it up and run off and carve the top block. It takes a lot of little details. Also in the front here where the cowling goes, I want to just run a bead of thin CA down here. These are all the little details that make for, when you go to pick somebody's plane up and it's just a little bit lighter and a little bit stronger, a lot of times you can't figure out why, but there's always a reason. Now also, this is another good step. On the very edge where the where we blended in the doublers, I always like to seal that up too and run the CA out onto the wood maybe an inch or so, so that I don't have a stress riser. I go from plywood to balsa wood to hardened balsa wood to ordinary balsa wood. Kind of a nice smooth transition. I just dress off all the edges and get the other three made up off camera. Now after that CA is nice and hard, you can just kiss each edge, radius each edge just the least little bit. And I want to take and blend that area in. Again, what I'm trying for is a blend where it goes from plywood right down into balsa in one constant decreasing radius. Yeah, and it seems like, it even seems to me like I'm spending a lot of time to get these sides right, but 
The sides are very important. You're going to run all your alignment off of them, and you can't start off with the thing being crooked, twisted. Again, one of the reasons for doing this is to seal this up. You can see how nice I've blended a nice transition from plywood into balsa. This is hardened balsa, and then it becomes soft balsa. What I did, I took the ruler and just put tape over all the holes underneath it so that I know where my center line is. I don't just by mistake pick another one up. Keep in mind I'm going senile here as I'm building. This just prevents you from using the wrong hole so that they're all exactly the same. Well, we get the square out and get a center line on all these fuse sides. Now, I've noticed one thing. No matter how good of a pen I have, when I go to do center lines, <laughs> it always either runs out of ink or coughs or whatever. Now, oh, I want to go back here. I'm not getting ahead of myself. I want to go back four inches so I can use this to line up my flaps into neutral. When I do the assembly, I want to have a complete center line on here. Now, no matter what plane you're building, now keep in mind, it's significant stuff. Well, no matter what plane you're building, you want to have this center line. We want to run, this is a parallel line. The thrust of the motor, the alignment of the wing, and a stab no matter how far up or back it goes. If you have this line on here and this fuse side stays straight, and let's hope it does stay straight, by the way. Yeah, that's real nice. That's real good. We'll check them all, though. We want to have that center line on there. And you get the crutch in straight. Now, when you line up the wing, if you have the center line, and in the case of Joe, he has a toothpick, uh, no point showing it, I know he has it. In the front of the wing on the center, the rib. So we'll line up that toothpick, we'll put a center line, we'll line that right up when we come to lining up the wing. So I'll just get all of these done off camera and then we can go on to laying out the fuse formers. Now what I want to do now, these sides are hopefully relatively straight and sanded out. Very important thing now is to get the nose moment arm put in. Re I'm going to use all my references off the trailing edge now. Line this up and make sure I have, and in this case it is pretty accurate, so real good. Okay, now I want to get rid of one fuse side and get my nose moment arm in here. And this will be the reference line for the bulkhead that will go right in front of the wing. Now I also know how thick that'll be, so I lay that eighth inch tape, just to give me a rough reference. Obviously you could measure it if you want. Now it's real important, with the way we build a fuselage, the way I build a fuselage, the way I've been shown, the Greenaway method, whatever you want to call it, name it whatever you want. It requires, it doesn't require any jig of any kind, it doesn't require any tooling, it just requires a little bit of alignment and an awful lot of common sense. Now what I'm going to make sure I get is the trailing edge referenced, and that's good. Now that I have the leading edge referenced, and both leading edges kind of disappear at the same time here. And I want to put my dots on here. And I can transpose this right over. And this is now going to be the 90 degree reference that everything gets laid in 90 degrees from this upper edge, thrust line, whatever you want to call it. And everything, whoops, everything from this point on is going to reference off this former 90 degrees to this edge. So what I want to do now, I want to lay out where the horn is going to go, and I know the length of the horn. I know when it's over in its furthermost laid back position, 
I know I need roughly, roughly an inch of clearance from the top, so I can mark that in. And I know that in the back, I need, and where the tail moment arm is, well, I need to figure out the tail moment arm. Yes. Again, this is the kind of stuff that once it, you have an 18-inch tail moment arm, once you get this all laid out, it makes building the fuselage very, very accurate, very, very light. And, well, I haven't had many fuselages that haven't had a really good motor run either, so I'm assuming this is a good way to build a fuselage. Time will tell. Now, here's the beautiful part. When I line this up, all I need to do is line up my, fr my former this way, and I can pick this line right up. One piece lines up the other piece. And when I lay out the formers, I need to only lay them out on one side, and the other side will fit right into position almost automatically. One side lines up the other. Now I know at this horn, I know I need clearance for this horn to lay back, and I know where the tail moment arm is, I know I need an inch and a quarter of clearance here so I can lay those two dots out and connect the line. Now I, need, I know I need to leave this area wide open for the arrow shaft. Now the purpose of doing this is in the old days I used to put all the formers in and then take a Dremel tool and cut all the formers out. Well. Why put them in if you're going to take them out? And I haven't found any weakness, any reason not to do it this way. Tsunami, Strega, all are built this way. They all seem to be relatively stiff enough that it shouldn't be a problem. All right, now that gives me the upper edge of all the formers. Now I know, starting from the tail moment arm back, and I have the tail moment, the hinge line back, I want to lay the formers out, and I always lay them out one inch apart. I guess in some cases you could spread them out a little further. Now, what I've found after building bodies in a lot of different ways is you want to get the formers as close together as possible. The closer you get them together, the stiffer the fuselage becomes. But you sure don't want to make them out of, in the old days we used to put them like three formers out of eighth inch wood. I make these out of 77 thousandths wood with the grain sideways. All these formers together are not any heavier than three eighth inch formers, but the, the result is the body is much stiffer. Also, when you dope it, you don't get this, where the, the fuselage side is everywhere there's a former. You don't see that starving horse look. So this, this area up here will be wide open. There'll be no formers in here because we know the arrow shaft has to run through there. And I'm going to space the formers out. And I want them to be 90 degrees from the top of the fuse line, that thrust line. So I'll use that reference off the top and just draw in all the lines. Now I'm just referencing and I'll go right down the whole fuselage side, leaving that space open for the arrow shaft, and just go right to the end of the fuselage this way, keeping all the formers at dead 90 degrees. I carry that one inch spacing right up to the front. I don't need a former around where the horn is going to go. It's going to be one of those things I'm only going to cut out. Leave this space blank. That former always gets cut out. This will probably get cut out too, and just enough that we can get the push rod in there. And I leave these formers in place. These formers stay in place while I'm carving blocks and whatever, and when I'm all done, I'll just trim them right out. That'll leave the fuselage nice and stiff. If you don't have that piece in there, what happens when you're carving a block, the thing is always breaking in your hand and you have no way of holding it. So now all I need to do is push the two fuselage sides together. I have them backwards here, excuse me. Put a dot and then transpose all my lines from the other side. Just repeat that right off on the other side. And the trick here is to line up the former that's going to be right in front of the wing. And it makes it real easy. You can just go right down, just put a dot there, and then 90 degree off at the top. One fuse side, you actually use one fuse side to lay out the other side. This way you know they're symmetrical. And you know the formers should all be in pretty close to a 90 degree angle then. All you need is a dot for each former. 
Again, you could use this method, and there are other methods, and I'm not going to try to uh, make a case for my method being better, worse, cheaper, or whatever, but there are jigs available. There are obviously a lot of different ways of building a fuselage. Now, I need to lay out my, uh, my line here. But, but I know this way will get you a good fuselage, and the whole rack is full of planes that are built this way. So this seems like a very good way. Even though it might be a little labor-intensive, it's going to be lighter, it's going to be straighter, and it's going to be stronger all at the same time. I have all the formers laid out. The next step is, and this is kind of a neat little thing you can use on any model, where the control horn is, we'd like to put the tailwheel former in on, a, on about a 30 or 40 degree angle. It'll stiffen up this whole back piece of the body at no extra weight because the, the tailwheel former acts as a former. So I'm going to tra trace that in where I feel it'll be to add the most rigidity to the fuselage. Now see, by putting the tail wheel directly under the horn location, I can eliminate one former here. By having it on a geodetic angle, it'll add a lot of rigidity. It'll also, now we're going to have to lay out the hatch here. I need a hatch on one side of the fuselage. I have to lay that out next. I want to have a hatch that I can get in there and adjust the controls. I've mentioned that earlier on in this video set. Okay, now what I did, off, I did off camera here is I replicated another two fuselage sides. So I have all the farmers marked out on the two body that hopefully we're going to get two bodies out of this, <laughs> unless one becomes a pretzel. Now the next thing I want to do, I want to lay out, before I do the hatches, I want to lay out a thin piece of carbon fiber across the top and bottom of each fuse side. That's to add a lot of rigidity, hopefully, number one. And number two, because we're going to have a hatch in the back, I think that'll stiffen up the back even more. Now, it's difficult to do this if you're working by yourself. One of the ways I've found that makes it a little bit more reasonable is get a, uh, a nice full can of something so that you have a working area here. Now this fuse doesn't move around while you're applying the carbon fiber. Now you can get carbon fiber from George Spar at Aerospace Composites. This is a roll I've had since uh, dinosaurs ruled the world. You really only have to, I think, only have to buy it once in a lifetime. I want to cut off two strips that are long enough. And you really don't want to get any hairs in this. It's kind of a nuisance getting it off the roll. Now the hardest part of this is I want to go up onto the plywood at least one inch. The hardest part is getting this started. I want it up on the plywood now. A good way to let it just dry off, press it down with the tube itself. Let that kick off. Now it's, it's on nice. I don't want to use any kicker here. I just want to use the bottom of the tube. Getting all the twists out of it is more work than anything else. Now I can kind of lay it down where I want it, go about two or three inches at a time, get it nice and flat and just put the CA on one end, it, it wicks right in. Maybe do one or two inches at a time, work my way right down the fuse side. Try if you can not to use any kicker at all. Remember we want all these stress riser lines to overlap and be in different places. I don't want any place where the vibration just ends and it becomes a fuse side. All right, let that go for another inch or so. Maybe an inch, inch and a half at a time. I'm going to just work my way right down to the end of the fuselage here. Let's try to spread this down. I'm going to try to get a couple inches at a time. Now, see, this, this stuff starts to just turn into hair if you're not careful. You can get maybe two or three of these done at once. But I want to wind up with a nice, a nice piece of carbon from one end of the fuse to the other, both sides, top and bottom, and that'll help to main maintain a lot of rigidity. Woo, this stuff stinks. Woo! Now, toward the end here, I can probably get, get most of the twists out of this. 
the, stu the problem with this stuff is it really starts to turn into fuzz and hair if you're not careful. You get all the twists out of it here. Maybe I can get a whole piece done at once here toward the end. Now the pressure of the tube kind of sets it into the wood at the same time it kind of kicks off the CA, the little dust that it makes. Now I can probably get this whole last piece if I get to manage to get the wrinkles out of it. Get it all, boy, it's hairs. And boy, does this stuff, I'm telling you, I'm getting a headache from the smell of this stuff. I really have never been sensitive to CA, but I'm getting sensitive to this. Breathing too much of this in at once. Now, I'm just taking a little piece of 220 and a foam block and just just kind of sanding it, letting the dust kick it off. I don't want to use any kicker at all on this if I can possibly help it. And of course, from time to time, I've glued and, and had the glue wick underneath. This one is good. And glued a fuse side to the table. Don't think you're the only one that happens to. Also want to take the straight block and just go right over the edge, get rid of all the hairs. The next step is I want to go up onto here about an inch or so and run me a same thing, just repeat the same thing over the whole bottom. So in effect I'll have a very rigid, I hope like an I-beam structure, very rigid and very torque resistant when this is all done and the formers are all in place. Now I got the first set of sides done and it looks like it's <coughs> sneaking up on that time that this session is going to be over so I'm going to come down tonight I think, well I hope I am going to be able to and get the other side done, make the hatches up, put the stringers in here, I don't know but one of the points I have is I can be thinking about this all day while I'm shoveling shit against the tide really. Some good news is uh, my partner in the machine shop Joe K managed to pick up a nice big job, I got the call this morning that uh, the cow is being milked down at the shop, so I'm going to go see if I can make some money, some real money. Now one of the things I forgot to do this morning, and I should have, is put a little dap on all these little pinholes, so this could be drying. Dap these little holes that we use to attach everything together, just put a little bit on there. And then I want to get the carbon fiber on these two pieces and then get ready to put the stringers in and make the hatch. Now, what's good is I've had all day to think about how I want to do it, and of course my magic brain is all cooked out and I have all these great ideas. We'll see how it's going to work out. Oh, well, these little speckles of dap can be drying while I'm working on the other pieces. And again, this is like an ongoing thing. I like to do this in an ongoing way so that I don't wind up at the end of having a whole plane together, having things to repair all over the place. It's easier, at least for me it is, to do this on an ongoing basis. All right, I'm going to get the carbon fiber, just like I did in the previous session, get these laid out.
about finished up with this part of the job. Now I'm going to go over to the scrap box and I want to get out some real nice light pieces of eighth inch. Make me up some stringers, reinforcement stringers here. Spackle these up, and I'll be ready to go. Hey, next thing I want to do, I want to get all these little blivets sanded out where all the spackle was. Which looks like it should be dry by now. Now looking through my scrap here, what I thought was scrap, I got a couple of pieces of 30 second sea grain that would really be of no value for anything else. I'm going to strip these off with a stripper. I was going to use 77 thousandths, but this wood just happens to be here and it happens to be sea grain. I'm going to strip off some pieces, because what I want to do, what I want to accomplish is to have the carbon fiber laminated into a sandwich, just pressed in, except for the part where the formers are going to be. I just want to laminate this piece right on top. I'll start just like I put the carbon fiber on, work my way down with the CA. Work my way down one little bit at a time, CA it on. Make sure it sticks out over the edge just a little bit so I can block sand it in right to its final shape. I want to make sure I just leave just enough of this hanging over the edge. And I got to work my way down that I can block sand that in. And I've sandwiched in that carbon fiber. It's completely enclosed in balsa wood. Now that seems to be the best that I've found of making it really, really strong without adding a lot of weight. Again, we did this on Midgley's body and it looked like it was pretty rigid when he left here. I don't know. We'll find out when he finishes it up. Again, I just got to work my way, just like with the carbon fiber, work my way right down. Now, I can't put this on the side that the, that the formers are in. I wish I could, but I can't, so I'll just give that side a couple extra coats of glue. Finalize this now on my piece of sanding belt that's glued to the table. I can just, I've got the mirror images here and I want to start this at the same spot. Laminate this right in exactly the way I did on the other side, and I'll have a match set. I mean, you love when your fingers get glued to this as you go. I'm just working my way down an inch or two at a time. If you keep your fingers moving, they generally, generally don't get glued to the part. Not always, though.
Now with the whole piece on, I can just run a bead right down the whole joint. And I got the first two stringers on there. These are ready to go. I'll do, the re the, do these other two off camera here just to save a little bit of time. Now I took the stab, laid the stab in position here and measured down to see how far down into the fuse this horn would sit. Now I have the carbon fiber running across here. I'd, I'd like not to cut through the carbon fiber. And you can see no matter which one of these push rod adjustments I'm going to use, I'm not going to have to get up this close. So what I want to do is, with my template, and I want to make this, I don't want to make this hatch real tiny so it's a pain in the ass to work on, but you can see I've got center lines here. And I'm laying this out on the inside of the fuse just so I can get an idea of exactly how I want this to be. Again, I have that hatch on the back of Tradition. I have this exact setup that's on Tradition, and it's been real good, so uh, I have no reason to really want to reinvent anything here. Now, what I want to do is, whenever you cut out, yeah, I can use that carbon fiber going right through there. I only want to have this on one side, number one. You don't need this on the other side. What I also want to have, and I'm going to have to figure out exactly, again, this takes some time to figure this out. I want to have either a screw in each end or somehow the screws in a very inconspicuous spot. And on tradition, I had a way of, uh, the tradition is still up at Scott Smith's house. I don't even have it. I had some kind of a little gizmo here and one screw to hold it on. So I'm going to look at maybe I can engineer it up that way. And of course, as always, a nice brand new blade. Now I can take that piece of copper tubing that I had, I don't remember what I was using this for. Just dress this edge off real nice. Then I want to harden this edge with CA. Before I go any further, I want this edge hard. Because when I go in here with a solder and iron or whatever, even just through the painting cycles, it's going to be a pain in the neck. I don't want to get it all chipped up. It's always nice when you can get a nice, nice edge around all these hatches and hatchways. Let's kick it off with the Q-tips. Want to dress all the edges off here as well as I can. Now I got a piece of 64th plywood. I want to get the grain going straight up and down. That'll allow this to be as rigid as possible. What I can do is just turn this over and trace the opening. I'm trying to <clears throat> trying to engineer this up so that I have a little lip on the inside so that the hatch will just sit on that lip. And the most important thing here is to have the grain going straight up and down, not front to back. Now after thinking about it, I even have a, an improved way of doing this. So I'm going to lose this original part. I'm going to let the back come in just a little bit and I can put my blind nut right in there so I can make this out of one piece. That's amazing. I'm doing this as I'm going along. I'm trying to improve it every step of the way. This will be <laughs> version two. See what I can do. I can make this part over and over again easy enough to make it until I'm real happy with the results. In his trial and error method. So a lot of these things look like they're going to be real easy until you go laying them all out.
Now, so far, I've engineered this up. There's the carbon fiber running through here, the grain going top to bottom. As you flip it over, you see where this little piece of a hatch is going to wind up. And we need to make a little, little blind nut. Now, what I have, I laid out where I want to have a blind nut here, and I want to have a little latch mechanism up here. And I think uh, that's going to be pretty much the same way I did tradition. That should be a good way to do it. Now I'm going to take the original hatch and just glue it to some 64th plywood here. I just trimmed the 64th plywood. Now what I want to do, I want to go around here with the Dremel tool and just make this perfectly even to the edge. I don't want to go any further out into it. So I want to use this to support this piece of wood. And I know that's the perfect piece. It's going to fit right in. I'll just dress this off with sanding block. One additional thing, and maybe I forgot to mention, is one of the things I wanted to be able to use this hatch for, as I did in tradition, is I can also put some tail weight in the plane without having it hang on to the strut. So if I want to bury the CG, whatever, I'll have what amounts to be a hatch for some tail weight, and to be able to adjust the length of the push rod and the ratio of the controls all in one hatch. So it's a significant thing. Now, the, the plywood is just the support so that when we put the bolt through here, we're, we're not screwing into raw balls wood. Now, I'm going to turn this over. I want to put this hatch right in place in the plane. Now, of course, we'll have to allow for the thickness of the, uh, the 64th plywood. But that hatch will drop right in there now. Now, I'm going to flip this over and mark this for the, uh, the blind nut. Okay, I drilled out the hole for the screw. Now I need to mark the location for the blind nut. I'm going to use 256 blind nuts, of course, 256 bolts. Now, what I need to know, I want to cut a little piece of plywood a little bit bigger than the blind nut. Now, the easiest way to do this, of course, Measure this up with a micrometer, get a nice precise hole, get the plywood, press the nut in, hit a little bit of glue on it. Make sure you don't get any in the threads. And then we'll cut this out on, on the, uh, the bandsaw. Now what I'm going to do is put this into the hatch, tighten the screw up, and that'll give me the alignment for this, and that'll hold it in alignment, and then I'll put some CA on it, tack it in place, and we should have our one hole down. Now I just want to line this up, make sure my hatch cover is pretty much centered the way I want it. And I'll just tack this in place. I don't want to glue it in because I want to get the bolt out of there. I don't want to have a chance at any, even though I put some WD-40 on this bolt, I don't want to take a chance at, ah, it's all glued in. And I'll get the hatch out of here and then glue it permanently. But I have it tacked in place right here, and I took the drill and just chopped the rest of the extra bolt off. I don't want that. The horn's going to be going back. and I don't want that in the way. I ran some thin CA in along here, also around here. Now I would like, and I'm trying to find these, some of those uh, pan head, not pan head, uh, what the hell are they call them, with the tapered, like a wood screw, tapered uh, top so that it'll drop in here 
and we won't need, uh, well hopefully, we won't need to have a bolt sticking high out. It'll be, uh, I don't know what they call it, tapered pan head, whatever the hell they are. I'll see if I have any in the junk drawer. You know, with the hatch missing, the hatch out of here, I can harden this whole area up with thin CA. And even if I get some down in a blind it won't be the end of the world now. But I wouldn't want to, and I have done it, is glue this in and then have the hatch wind up being glued in position. I want to make this fuel proof too, just in case some little bit of fuel does work its way in here. There's just one more of those little details that uh, if you do them all and you do them well, plane is a joy to have around. And when you have things that, I'll just give you an example. I, that little hatch is on tradition. As many times as I've taken them out, put them back, no problem. If this was to strip out or something up here go wrong, this could be a nightmare. It could be a real pain in the ass. Now, I still need to make myself a little catch for up in the front of this. I need to make a little latch up here. Now, you believe out of this, this whole drawer of bolts, I mean, there has to be 10,000 bolts. I don't have a 256 with the head that I'm looking for, the type of head. In fact, I don't, this is what I'm looking for. Yeah, I know what I'm looking for, all right. Frustrating, I need more junk. Maybe if I had more junk, I'd be more fortunate. Anyway, this is why I save everything, because you never know. Hey, now, this is your job, Adam Usko. You're part of the deal. You got to get a handful of screws, 256 with that type of head and with an Allen of course <laughs> anyway and if you really want to be cool maybe we can get Frank McMillan to give us some aluminum screws micro fasteners has the aluminum screws by the way we may have to get some but that's what I'll be looking for in the near future just if I won't worry about it now but I would like to have that in combination of that I'll just fit flush with the top of the finished part Now, because I don't have the screws that I really want, taking some copper tubing with a sharp edge and relief, making a little relief so that I can, what I want to do, I can drop a washer down in there because I don't think the 64th plywood would last indefinitely. That'll hopefully brace it up just enough. And that should make a very uh, a nice solid installation. Now remember the hatch is a 64th bigger because of the plywood and I can't get around it all at once. Now I need to make just a little catch here. I need to make uh, the thickness, let's see, of 64th plywood first and then a little piece that sticks out over here so it'll act like a little finger over the edge. You know, this little piece brings me up to the height that I'm even with the piece alongside of it. And I can just tack this. In fact, you know what I want to do? Let me get the grain going this way. Such a fanatic. Adam Usko would be proud. Adam Usko, get a couple dozen of those aluminum screws, too. Just tack this in position. I'm just going to laminate up some scraps of 64th plywood. Probably three of them will be enough. With the grain all going in one direction. That a little piece has raised me up exactly to the right height. And I would assume I can tack this in position before I commit here and see how this opens and shuts. Now you can look at the final configuration and see how that locks its way right in place. When you put this in from the outside it presses in. It almost locks without the screw. Looks good so far. That looks like it's going to work real well. Uh, 
I just need to get, if I had that nice screw, of course, I wouldn't have to do this, get most of that 64th of material off. And what I can do, because I have such a nice lock, uh, locking mechanism here, by the way, this really does work good. Okay, I can kind of do this, except for the fact that I'm going to wind up hitting that washer eventually. All right. Wrong end of the sand person. Get that hatch. Make sure all the edges are hardened up. Now as we put dope on this tissue and filler coat, whatever, we can get that edge really perfect. Actually, it doesn't look too bad right now. But knowing Adam Musco, he'll make it even better. Now it may seem like, wow, that wasn't much of a job. Well, you know what? That consumed the better part of a day, and I'm going to do the other one tomorrow. I'm, uh, I'm bummed out from this already. This, this took a lot longer than I thought it would, but I think it was worth it. This is about as light as I can make a hatch, reliable that I can get in there, and with all the criteria that I set up for this hatch, I wanted to have a nice edge. I don't want to have corners, so I think this is going to fill the bill. And what I'll do, I'll come back down to shop tomorrow and I'll just re replicate the other one into the other fuselage side. I only have to do this in one side, by the way. Oh, now, in this session, I want to try to remember what I was supposed to be doing here. All right, I guess I have to put the hatch on the back of the other fuselage side. I guess step one here is, and boy, you can bet I'm going to do this before the year is over. I have to make sure I'm using the right fuse side. So here's a good tip. Get rid of the other two fuse sides right off the table before you wind up making a hatch on the wrong side. And I want to look at this. Now, because I've done this ahead of time, you know, I, you would think or hope that uh, I could rush right through this, and maybe I can, I don't know. Or I could save some time because yesterday I engineered this up about five different ways before I was happy with it. But it all seemed worthwhile. This little hatch worked out so nice. I was real happy the way it worked out. So I'm just going to take the one side now. And I obviously everybody isn't building two planes. Maybe we're unique here. We're building two at a time. But uh, anyway, what I can do is line up the two fuse sides, make sure I'm referencing off of that the former in the front. This way at least they'll be as close as possible. Again, I'm always hoping that I'm going to have these very, very similar in every way. The advantage being that all the trim things and props and motors and compression and everything that works on one should in, should in theory work on the other one also. So the first thing I can do is trace the hole out. Now, the second time you repeat any, any uh, redundant operation, you always think of little things that might have made it easier. In this case, I was thinking, well, this template might give me a nicer edge. See, these are the kind of things that when you do the same job over and over again, you come up with these brilliant little ideas. Now, I'll try this and see how it works. Again, always the brand new, brand new number 11 blade. Try to hold the knife 90 degrees if you can. Any little tips, any little ideas, you can use this in a lot of other applications from cowlings to tip weight boxes. Again, I kind of did the other one freehand. I think maybe this would be an improvement. And let's see, I'd, I'd like to be able to put as many improvements on the video as possible. Oh, I know I, I just happened to come across this too. This will probably help get me a nicer edge also. And I'll harden it up with CA just like I did on the other one. I'm trying to be even more careful to get a nice fit as I go along on this little hatch.
you know, I'm trying to make that hatch fit just a little bit snugger on this time around. Now, to show you how lucky you can get, believe it or not, of all the things, I forgot I had them. I got the screw from Frank McMillan. The, let me show this on there. It's good to have a memory at my age. And I that screw with a little Allen head. And these come from micro fasteners. It's a little Allen. At a Musco, I want two dozen of these, and it's aluminum, so it'll be a little lighter than the other one. Here's what happens when you run through, you run through the thing a second time, you always wind up saving a little time or whatever, and then you find out, oh, if I only did it that way the first time. Anyway, my second hatch is almost, you got to put the blind nut in and then sand it all down. But it did go considerably a lot faster than the first one. Now, just to show you, this is a plug for micro fasteners. If you call micro fasteners, you want to talk to John. Here's the phone numbers. Tell John Wendy sent you, and you'll get a free slice of pizza with every thousand bolts. Here's the address. He's in New Jersey, 110 Hillcrest Road, Flemington, New Jersey. Now, one of the things I like to do, you know, I found, by the way, let's check this out. Look how nice this. Does this look pro stun or what? Perfectly flush. Real nice. Boy, when that's embedded in there, I just harden the wood up around it. Perfect. Micro fasteners will send you this catalog, and boy, it is. I couldn't find this before. I wasn't thinking about it. See, that's the problem with brain damage like I have at this age. Look at this. I can't even open the page. Anyway, it's got hundreds and hundreds of little items. The aluminum screws are definitely something you may or may not want to have. They're reasonably priced in reasonable amounts. I think he sells them in quantities of 50, but I'm going to be ordering some next week or whenever. In the meantime, we do have one. Adamusco, you only have to find one screw now. <laughs> Unbelievable. This is what you find the second time around. And when you take the screw out, this is a good little tip. When you take the screw out, I've already done this. Of course, it pays to have the wrench here. I put some thin CA on the end of the Q-tips, and you can see it leaves just a perfect little funnel-shaped little recession. And that's it's really, that is a nice touch, a nice final touch. I'm just finalizing this up, and this will probably be about the end of it tonight. If you, uh, if you can believe how long these little hatches take. But they are in position now. Now you notice on, on my hatch, second one, this I made a little bit longer in both dimensions, and this one has that recessed screw. doesn't really matter. I just try to make some little subtle improvements on the second one. today I want to lay out and uh, do the saw work on the crutches I want to explain what I have I have two boxes of motor mounts these are half inch these are 3 8 by half inch what I want to do is I want to go through almost every one here and I want to find the two straightest ones and you'll notice they're in match pairs when John Gayuski cuts these he always cuts them into match pairs I want to also have the grain that when I look at the grain from the end I'm making like a sandwich with the bolts very important. And to do this, uh, it's just going to be time consuming. I want to go through every set of mounts. I want to sight each one. I want to get the two straightest ones I can out of here. The reason for that is, a lot of times when you do the saw cut or the milling work on the mounts, in this case, <clears throat> here's an old set of mounts I made with a ball mill. What happens is, 
you relieve the stress in the wood and it, it pops, it twists, it does crazy things. So a lot of times you need to saw up two or three sets of mounts to get one set that doesn't spring. And keep in mind, we're using match sets. This is cut from the same piece of wood, pieces right by each other. So you would think or hope that they're both going to spring the same way. They're not going to go like a pretzel, like a whatever. So I'll go through these and I'll pick out what I hope is going to be enough mounts. Although it doesn't mean that after the first or second set you wouldn't have a good set, but I want to have, say, the best three or four sets. In fact, while I have the saw set up, I can make some extra sets. This way I'm ahead of the game on setup time. Now here's a set I made up years ago with a ball end mill. It's nice, it puts a nice radius in there. The only problem is where it ends, it ends at a, a very abrupt ending. What I want to have is that tapered end that I get from the diameter of the saw blade. A little more work doing it with a saw. This was one of the experiments I had done years ago. Now, Midgley was going to make me up a whole bunch of these on uh, the milling machine up there. He didn't have time to do it, he's real busy with his job, so Obviously, we'll just run off a couple of sets down here. Now, you can see the way the grain in this piece runs side to side, so we would want to have the bolt go this way. And we'd also want to do the C-channel the same way the grain goes, so that we still can run the bolts through here, pinching the wood in this dimension. The thickness of this blade, what I have to do is I have to take three cuts. My primary cut and I'll adjust the saw for a little greater depth. I'd like to have eighth inch thickness all around, like an eighth inch C-channel. And I'll move the blade over this way and that way with the rip fence just a little bit. See what happens and what's nice, and this was just a test cut, you get that nice taper. It doesn't, it doesn't end abruptly like a stress rise, you get a nice even edge. Now I'm just putting a mark on the saw here. The object that this is so I know how far into the mounts I want to go. And what I don't want to do, I want to leave the last, the part where the motor is and about another two or three inches solid. So this tells me I'll have the bolt, all the mounts that I'm going to cut will stop at the same spot. Now obviously there's a lot of good safety precautions to take here. And I usually don't take any of them. <laughs> it's not on purpose, believe me. I, I would want to come up with the blade just a little bit each time. See how that's rising? And that tells me how much the blade has. I want to go down a little bit. Half a turn. Now I'm just establishing here. Just establishing the height. So I know I can come up with the blade just a little more. And again, these are just test cuts to set the saw. Now that shows me how far I've gotten. Let's see if I can get this on. Don't look at that other little cut. I just hit it on an angle the wrong way. There we go. I want this. This whole end is going to get cut off because these are way longer than they have to be. I want this dimension to be an eighth inch, and I can measure that with a micrometer. You know, I know I have the saw set for the depth at roughly 120. That's certainly close enough. Now I'll want to cut the length of the mount cut the depth, then move the blade to the right and the blade to the left so I get the full C channel and I can measure both sides same way with the micrometer. So just a couple of things that make this job a lot better. By the way, I did get this saw from Don Patterson's father and I have a relatively nice blade, but it's a good idea if you're going to do this to use a carbide blade if you can afford one, about a $20 carbide blade. You also can do this two ways. You can run the mounts all the way over 
end them at a certain stop point and that will leave this as the saw cut or you can cut them this way and then just trim off the end for the, the mount. You can do it either way. I'm just doing it the way that's the most convenient for me. notice I try to let the let the wood go through the blade as slow as possible so I get a nice clean cut I don't need a lot of sanding that way now I have the cut all the way to one end so what I'll do is I'll run off a few extra mounts now because we don't know if some of these are going to spring I'll run a couple extra off I just took the side cut. I see I can move the, move the blade over even a couple more thousands. The easiest way to do this is just loosen it up and just, God, just tap it. And you have to make another test cut, of course, and see how far. Now you can see we're way off to one side. I want to get that one more little tap, so I'll have 120 thousandths on all sides. And then I'll move the grip fence the other way and channel out the other side. So it'll be three individual cuts to get this the way I want it. Now, because I'm a production kind of guy, I always run off a couple extra sets. What this allows me to do is, let's say there's a customer that wants to have a set of replicated mounts like I have, I can then soak them for the full setup charge, which is usually zero. I even made up another set of experimental ones, and I don't know which ones I'm going to use yet. I'm going to, but by cutting up several sets, I'll have a lot of choices. I'll set the rip fence for the other cut. Again, I want to make half inch and three eighth both, and I can, you know, I can go either way depending on how I want to do this. Now I can tell just by looking that's not going to be right. It takes a little fiddling and always make a little test cut on the end. 